Uh, welcome back to the afternoon session. Uh, Antonio Curi, or Zela, is lecturing the third part of his course to us. Uh, thank you very much, Zela. Okay. Uh, still, okay. So we now go to the last uh, part of this uh, series of three lectures. And so the idea today is to continue the discussion about the quantization of the electromagnetic fields and bring the concepts of the, uh, of the quantized field <coughs> into the problem of this structural non-separability between orbital and uh, spin parts of, uh, of a paraxial mode, okay? And it's, it's especially to uh, discuss what, in which case uh, this structural non-separability uh, between these two classical degrees of freedom, they become genuine quantum entanglement, okay? So let's go back to, the, to our construction of the mode structure. Uh, <coughs> we have quantized the electromagnetic field as a, a, an ensemble of harmonic oscillators or where the harmonic oscillators were the bones. And uh, I, I stress the fact that the modes they are established by the by the boundary conditions that we impose on the on the field, okay. So uh, the uh, the vector space for the multi-mode uh, electromagnetic field is composed as a tensor product of individual vector spaces uh, of the modes, and then uh, we defined already the Fox states, which are the, the states which uh, with a well-defined number of excitations or any of energy excitation in, in each mode. Okay, so this is the multi-mode uh, Fox state that we will re represent it like that. Okay, or equivalent is a tensor product over all modes of well-defined numbers of photons in each mode. Okay, so this is a, 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 a specific quantum state. It will it is often used as a basis for the multi-mode vector space of the electromagnetic field. Uh, those modes, uh, so also the operators, uh, each mode, the operators that acted on this uh, state space of each mode will be extended to the whole multi-mode space. And we in, uh, then identify these Fox states as the eigenvectors of the number uh, operator. Okay, so the operator that reflects the fact the, uh, the, the, the reflects the, the, the number of excitations in each mode. So as I said, this quantization of the electromagnetic field is something uh, different from first quantization because the number of particles in the, in the problem is itself an operator, a quantum operator, which is uh, uh, often out of the scope of the quantum information uh, theory approach, okay? So, uh, then, we, in this uh, <coughs> Fock, <coughs> Fock basis, we have the vacuum operator, uh, vacuum state, which is the state that corresponds to no excitations in all modes. This is completely vacuum, okay? And associated with the vacuum, there is the so-called uh, uh, zero-point energy, which is the expectation value, or the eigenvalue of the, eigen, of the electromagnetic field Hamiltonian. And actually, this corresponds to a zero-point energy for every mode that you have uh, in, the, in the field, okay? So this vacuum energy, it gives rise so to no uh, mean value field. However, there are fluctuations, and these fluctuations they, they, are, they justify the energy, the zero-point energy that we have in the electromagnetic field. They give rise, for example, to spontaneous emission. So they are uh, in, in the description of the interaction of a, a single atom with the electromagnetic reservoir, as Sabrina mentioned this, uh, this morning. And they also have, a, a, another, have another, uh, that they so, another important effect, the so-called Casimir force. So the Casimir force is very important because it's exactly what relates the, the zero-point energy to the boundary conditions to which the modes they are constrained. So if you 
If you add, the, uh, if you change the boundary conditions, then the, the mode frequencies will change, then the vacuum, this vacuum energy will change in associated with this energy, uh, uh, zero point energy change, there must be some force. And this is called the Casimir force, okay? Uh, what about coherent state? So the, coherent, the single mode coherent state is a, 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 an, eigen, a, an eigen vector of the annihilation operator. So again, we can define the multi-mode coherent state as a tensor product for, of coherent states for, for the, uh, all the modes. And this is usually the best description of classical sources of light, okay, like a laser beam, for example. Uh, and so they are uh, eigenvectors of the uh, annihilation operator. The annihilation operator is not emission, though, so the eigen, its eigenvalue is a complex number, okay? And there is a complex amplitude that is associated uh, then with, the, with, with each uh, coherent state. So they are indexed by, by this uh, complex amplitude. So the expectation value of the electromagnetic field uh, simply, is simply the expression of the, the quantized field, but we replace the annihilation operator and the creation operator by the complex amplitudes alpha and alpha star. So this somehow resembles what we our, our uh, uh, classical description of the electromagnetic field, okay? And uh, then, of course, uh, what's, what's the building block for uh, forming this, mathematically, for building this uh, coherent state? So the, the, the building machine is the, the so-called uh, uh, displacement operator, so I can have this uh, exponential, this unitary operator, multi-mode unitary operator, in which I combine displacement operators for each mode. And then with this, by acting this multi-mode displacement operator on the vacuum state, I generate a multi-mode coherent state, okay? So whenever I want to construct a coherent state, mathematically, I just make the displacement operator act on the, on the vacuum state, or if I want to create a, 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 a Fox state, I I let the uh, creation operator act as many times as I want on the vacuum state. And then I will generate uh, Fox states with as many excitations as I want, okay? So one simple example is suppose that we take as our mode structure the usual plane waves. And then we say that in a given mode that is polarized along the x direction and propagates along the z direction, I have a coherent state with amplitude alpha. When we, we compute the uh, expectation value of the electromagnetic field, what we, we find is this, the usual uh, uh, harmonic dependence of, uh, uh, of the electromagnetic field uh, with a propagating term Kz, uh, sinus of Kz minus omega t. Okay, polarized at the x direction. So this is, the, in this sense, we say that the coherent states, they are like, they, they present classical behavior. Okay, because the expectation value of the fields, they imitate what we expect for the, for, for classical variety, for classical fields. So now we, we start to, to talk about the delicate issue regarding entanglement, and separability when we deal with the electromagnetic modes, okay? So this is, uh, uh, then we can, we must come to the, to the, to the question of mode transformations. So how uh, uh, does the, 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 the corresponding operators and the corresponding states transform when we make mode combinations, okay? So in fact, we can, uh, as I said, the, the main scheme of the quantization of the electromagnetic field is you elect an ensemble of modes that are adapted to your boundary conditions. Then you define the, 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 the canonical uh, conjugate variables, which are the quadratures, the annihilator, annihilation operators, creation operators, and so on. Uh, but I, I stress the fact that the, the mode structures, the mode functions, they are uh, classical structures in the sense that they are, uh, uh, they are the same whether we deal with a quantized field or a non-quantized field. 
So quantization has no consequence on our concept or our definition of numbers. But still, I can uh, uh, I can put the question of what what if I start uh, uh, with a different mode structure? So, for example, suppose I in free space I have I, I decide to use plane waves, and then I define creation and annihilation operators for plane waves, Fox states and coherent states for plane waves. And then I want to describe the same electromagnetic field, but now using spherical waves. So what, how, how can I express a Fox state with a single photon in a plane wave in terms of a decomposition of spherical waves? How could we do that? Okay, so this is the, the, the question that we are going to, to address right now. Okay, but in simpler examples then, plane wave to spherical waves. So the mode transformation, when we change from one mode structure to another mode structure, usually we have uh, this mode transformation connected by some unitary matrix. So it's important to understand that, so this, there's something that is a bit uh, dangerous that the mode structure itself, even in classical optics, they form a Hilbert space. They are uh, normalized and they are uh, ortho orthogonal to each other. So you have your lecta basis, it's a vector space with a complex, you can define a complex vector space and use them like that. But they are not quantum states. Okay? So we change the, uh, our mode decomposition to a different mode decomposition. We do that by, uh, with the aid of a unitary matrix here. So we are, we are going only to discuss the mode transformations in which we don't, we don't mix different frequencies. All right? So this will render everything easier in this case. You can do, you can extend to different frequencies, but then you have to be careful. Uh, especially because the, the energy of each mode depends on the frequency. So if you combine modes with different frequencies, a single excitation will not be an eigenstate of the Hamiltonian, of the free Hamiltonian. It will not be, it will not be a stationary state. Okay? So, here's, here's the point. So, we, let's take, for example, the vector potential from which, well, the vector potential from which we derive the electric field, the magnetic field, and uh, uh, the physical fields in general. So, and uh, let's, for example, suppose that I want to re-express the fields in, that were originally expressed in this U mode basis. Now I want to switch it to the V mode basis. Well, it's, I'm, I'm making a description here of the same physical object, which, which is the whole field. So, if I want to replace the U modes by V modes, then, of course, I need to also transform the corresponding uh, amplitudes, time varying amplitudes. In this case, the annihilation operators. So, a mode transformation between uh, uh, the, the matrix U that, gover that governs the transformation from these ba mode bases to these mode bases will also appear, it has to appear here in a transformation between the, the corresponding amplitudes. So this combination here must be equal to that one. And the only way is that you define new annihilation and creation operators that are related exactly by the, the, the matrix that transforms the modes. You see uh, high here, however, we have this uh, Dega, uh, there is some technical, you have to do it carefully, but essentially it's the same matrix that will connect the, the old uh, Amplitudes the old operators to the new ones. Okay, so since this is unitary, you can show that this preserves the, the commutation relations. Okay, so the new annihilation and creation operators that are generated by this uh, uh, expression here, they also present the use of the usual commutation relations, uh, which and also it does not affect the the the. Um, uh, the structure of the Hamiltonian. So the Hamiltonian is also a sum of uh, number, uh, essentially the number uh, operators, in this new mode 
uh, in this new uh, in this new new mode uh, decomposition. Okay, so this kind of transformation because it's unitary, it does not change the commutation relations and the Hamiltonian. So in the new description of the electromagnetic field, we'll have new operators, but they will have the same algebraic properties as the formal ones. This is very important, okay? So in this sense, we can, of course, define uh, uh, the, the Fox states in one, uh, 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 we can calculate the Fox states in one new uh, mode structure in terms of the Fox states of the, of the old structure. How, the, how can we do that? So as I said, we start with the vacuum. So the absence of excitation, this is a fact that it's the same in whatever mode decomposition. If you have no photons, it doesn't matter if you have no photons in plane waves or in spherical waves or whatever. It's just no photons. So the vacuum is the same for any mode decomposition. And then starting from the vacuum, we use our building block, which is the creation operator. So if I want to, to, to define the Fox states in the new mode decomposition, I just act the new creation operator on the vacuum state, and then I will obtain the, the corresponding Fox state. But remember, we have a transformation law between the, 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 the new uh, creation operator and the old ones. So I can plug the transformation law here, and then I can establish a relationship between the, the, the new Fox states and the old Fox states that we have. So it it's looks really complicated here, but of course we are going to show examples in simple cases, okay? And to interpret the physical meaning of this kind of transformation. Of course, this kind of uh, transformation between, in, between the new Fox states and the old ones does not change the total number of photons. So the, the, now the quantum uh, matrix that connect the old uh, Fock basis to the new Fock basis is block diagonal in the sense that it preserves the total number of photons. Since this mode transformation is a unitary process, it doesn't, it doesn't take out energy, it doesn't take out any information from the, our physical object, which is the electromagnetic field, okay? Any questions so far? Uh, yeah, sure. Uh, uh, the U, nu, nu? This U here? Uh, yes, that, that is on a matrix, on an element of a matrix. I'm sorry, it's a, uh, uh, a unitary matrix, uh, uh, but it's not a quantum operator. Yeah. It's not a quantum operator, it's just a unitary matrix. So each U, nu, nu are unitary are, matrix? Uh, these are uh, the entries of the matrix, okay? These are the entries of the matrix. So the, the matrix, uh, this matrix must have uh, how many elements, as how many modes are involved in the transformation. Mm, yeah. Okay? Thanks. And it's unitary. Uh, it will be uh, it will become clear when we come to the simple examples. Okay. So, uh, what about the coherent states? How do we change the? Co how do we define the new coherent states in there in terms of the old ones? Now again, I will resort to the to the my U matrix here that will make the transformation between the old annihila uh, annihilation operators and the new ones and the old creation operators and the new ones, okay? And then I can use the displacement operator as my building machine for coherent states. So I take this uh, coherent state in the, in the new basis, I write it down, write it as a, as a displacement operator of the corresponding amplitude acting on the vacuum. In this displacement operator, it appears explicitly here, the new annihilation and creation operators. And then I plug in the transformation that I have here in this expression. And I end up with something that is a tensor product of individual displacement operators in the, uh, in the modes that, uh, uh, 
that compose the new modes, the, the old modes that compose the new modes. So in this way, I can map uh, between the two mode decompositions the new, uh, uh, the old and the new coherent states. Okay, and the corresponding amplitudes, complex amplitudes, the, uh, which are the, the, the eigenvalues of the coherent states, they are connected exactly by the same, by the same matrix U. Okay, they are connected by the same matrix U. So you could uh, uh, organize these amplitudes for all the modes in a, in a column vector, and then you would have here on the, on the right hand side a matrix product. This square matrix here by this column, another column vector for the new uh, amplitudes, okay? So let's go for some simple examples. So one simple example is uh, in which we, we physically perform a mode transformation is a beam splitter, okay? Suppose that you have a beam splitter, a 50-50 beam splitter, you have input modes, the input ports, the output ports, so the input functions and the output, the input modes and the output modes, they are related like that, okay? So V1 is just uh, the sum of the input modes over square root of two, the V2 is the, the difference over square root of two, this is the matrix U, okay? This is the matrix U, so, uh, and from this matrix here, you have, uh, so you, you have, you need to be consistent with the fact that a, a combination of U1 and U2 with amplitudes A1 and A2, this is described the same, the same uh, uh, electromagnetic field, the same object. So they, they must match. So the new uh, uh, annihilation operators combined with the new mode functions, they must add up to the same as here. So this impose a transformation also between the annihilation and creation operators in the old and in the new mode structure, okay? So suppose I take now a state, suppose I, I have here, I say that I have uh, a total of uh, capital N photons arriving in the beam splitter, and these input photons, they are split like that. I have uh, uh, lowercase n in mode U1 and the rest in mode U2. So what's the the output, what's the state of the output modes here? How can I bring, how can I build this state? So then I write this state as, uh, uh, as uh, the action of the creation operators on the vacuum state, and then I use this decomposition, and then I will have the Fox, the combination of Fox states in the new mode structure, okay? For example, suppose we have uh, a photon pair. Suppose that, that we have a photon pair impinging on the, on the beam splitter, so I have one photon in mode U, U1, one photon in mode 2, in the input mode uh, 2, and then I write this state like this, A dagger 1, A dagger 2 acting on the vacuum, and then I translate it to the new bases, the output modes. And that's quite, quite interesting because when I combine these, uh, these, uh, these modes, these uh, expressions here, what I see is that, for example, since B1 and B2 they commute, we see that the cross terms in this product here, they will cancel out. Because B dagger 1 times B dagger 2 is equal to B dagger 2 times B dagger 1. And because of this minus sign, the cross terms, they cancel out. So since they cancel out, we have this combination here, and what we get is an input of a, 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 a pair of photons that comes into the, uh, in the, input, uh, in the input modes of the beam splitter, they must end up in this state here. Either I have two photons at output port one and zero at output, output port uh, two, or the other way around. And this is the well-known Honkel-Mandel effect, okay? We know that the photons, they will uh, coalesce and go out through one given port of the, 
output port of the beam splitter. Okay, so this is one simple application of the ideas uh, that I, I presented before. This can also be uh, be uh, applied to linear polarization modes. So suppose I have this uh, linear polarization uh, way, uh, mode vectors like a horizontal and vertical, and I can I want to describe them now. I want to to map the description of these two polarization modes into plus and minus 45 degrees uh, uh, polarization unit vector. So this is the transformation, the polarization transformation uh, um, relations. So this is the matrix, it's the same as the beam splitter, okay? And so the relationship between the annihilation and creation operators for the new polarization uh, modes is, this, is the same, is the same as before, okay? And then, of course, the same kind of uh, uh, Hongu Mandel effect should uh, happen in the in the in the case of polarization modes. Okay, but before going to this, let's let's touch a, a, a very delicate problem here. Suppose we have, for example, uh, a state a single photon. Before going to the two photon uh, states, let's go to the single photon state. Suppose that you have a, a Fox state with a single photon on the, uh, on the plus 45 degree polarization and zero photons in the minus 45 degrees. So it's a Fox state. I have one single photon, it's polarized at plus 45 degrees, okay? And then, I can write this uh, as the, uh, the corresponding creation operator acting on the vacuum. I can map it uh, to the new polarization uh, decomposition, to the old uh, polarization decomposition. And then what we, get, what we have here is that, is that the one photon polarized. So, so this state here, which corresponds to one photon at polarization plus and zero at polarization minus, it, it corresponds to an entangled state of the polarizations H and V. It's a superposition between having one photon at H, zero photon at V, or zero photon at H, and one photon at V. Now we have to be very, very careful, okay? Very careful, because the left-hand side is a factorized state, it's a product state, and the right-hand side is an entangled state. But the mode transformation that we are talking about here in this language is a non-local operation. So it's not, it's not uh, surprising uh, that we end up with, a, with an entangled state, okay? And also, the change from here to here is not just a change, a basis in the Hilbert space. So when you define whether, mode, if you want to decide whether the quantum state of a composite system is entangled or not, you must beforehand establish what are the systems that you are talking about. Okay? So in this case, we are talking about E plus and E minus. So this is a different, it's one partition in the electromagnetic field, in the polarization of the electromagnetic field. And this is another partition, it's completely different. So whether, uh, whether there is entanglement or not, does depend on, on the way you input partitions on your complete physical system, okay? So there is no contradiction in this equality here. But let's see uh, if, there's, if this has some physical consequence, okay? So in, in this case, what happens here is that suppose I, I send one photon polarized, polarized at E plus, I will send it to a, a, a polarizing beam splitter that is oriented to transmit H and reflect V. And at the output of, at each output of, uh, of this polarizing beam splitter, I, I place an atom. Okay, so I have a, here a two level system. And the, the, both atoms, they are uh, in the, both atoms, they are initially in the ground state, so it's a product state. But then, since you don't know, you have a superposition between the, the, 
Uh, oh my sorry. Wait a minute. There's something. Just a minute. Yeah. Okay, it's right. Okay. So since the output of the photon here is a is an entangled state one zero zero one, you don't know which port the which port the, the, the photon is going to, to get out then you don't know which atom is going to absorb the photon. And suppose that this is a 100% uh, cross-section process, okay? And then the atoms will end up in a superposition between AG and GE, EG and GE, okay? So the two atoms will end up in an entangled state. So this kind of mode entanglement can be transferred to the atoms, okay? So you have the two possibilities here, either the atom is transmitted, either the atom is uh, reflected, and this causes, this creates this entangled state. Now, if you, you have the same input polarization state for the photon, but now your physical device is oriented differently. You have a polarizing beam splitter that is oriented to transmit plus and reflect minus. Well, in this case, you get only this atom, at, which is in this port here, will get atom uh, uh, one, will get excited. The other one will not get excited. Then you start with the product state, you end up for the atom with the product state. Okay? So, no entanglement transfer. So, whether you, you are going to use, and this is something that I said from the beginning, whether you are going to use one um, uh, mode decomposition or the other depends on the boundary conditions. I said this many times. And the polarizing beam splitter is a boundary condition. If it's oriented to, to transmit H and reflect uh, V, then H and V is the best, is the most adapted uh, mode decomposition to the problem, to the physical problem that you have. But if it's oriented to, to transmit plus and reflect minus, it will be the other basis. Okay, and of course, the, uh, the entanglement that you measure will depend on how you are going, which mode structure that you are going to choose. 